Christmas was a busy time for Andrew Astbury. He needed to leave his girlfriend's place early to make deliveries for his courier business the next morning. But those deliveries would never be made. And his girlfriend and family would rely on the wisdom of forensics to find him and discover the truth. I just didn't believe from the start that uh, it was anything other than a pretty vicious attack. Hey! There was no other reason at all as to why that vehicle would have been there. He'd uh, made threats there to uh, shoot him with a shotgun. I saw what looked like crushed cherry marks, red, sticky. Luminol normally just reveals small pools of blood, but this is quite an extensive trail. It didn't lend itself that the person had walked off. More likely they'd been carried or dragged away. We knew a lot of what he was telling us was, was uh, rubbish. And he made some comment about uh, we'd never be able to get him. My reaction to that was as well, we'll see what comes about. When Andrew Astbury failed to turn up for work, his family and friends were immediately concerned. His van was parked in his driveway, and yet the 24-year-old was nowhere to be found. The investigation into his disappearance would lead detectives down a path of jealousy, hatred, and lies. Andrew's van was parked in a position where it is normally parked, uh, at the top of the driveway. Andrew's wallet was in the van along with his mobile phone. And according to all who knew Andrew, he just never went anywhere without it. However, there was no damage to the vehicle. There was no uh, signs around the vehicle on immediate inspection that anything untoward had taken place. We went into the house and it was quite obvious that Andrew hadn't slept in his bed. So it was obvious after speaking with friends, relatives, and Andrew's girlfriend, that he hadn't simply taken a day off work and gone to play golf and forgotten to tell someone about it. Andy was a very hard-working, dependable person. He, he had a, a courier delivery service, basically, and the restaurants that he delivered to depended upon him delivering every morning their food for that day. So for him not to turn up at work and not to deliver the food was just totally uh, exceptional. Well, I suppose uh, initially uh, our thoughts were that any number of things may have occurred to Andrew. We weren't sure whether we were in fact investigating a crime at that stage or whether there was a legitimate reason for Andrew not to be found. So we had to explore all avenues. The police raised things like, uh, was he in money trouble? Was he involved in criminal activities or drug activities? As he was a distributor driving around a lot, was he involved in something that was not quite right? As he searched the area, John Astbury found some unusual spots on the road outside his son's house. In walking down the road, I saw uh, what looked like um, crushed cherry marks, red, sticky. There were no cherry trees around, so I, I thought, well, maybe it's blood. When we had a closer look at them, they appeared to be blood, and it certainly drew a more sinister tone to the investigation. If it were blood, it didn't look like a life-threatening amount. So I guess I just was even more confused, because if he was injured, then, you know, why hadn't he made contact? We immediately sort of started to search the area to see if he was lying unconscious in the bush somewhere close by. And there was another concern. Andrew's girlfriend, Shannon, told the police about his state of mind the last time she saw him, only 14 hours before. It was close to Christmas time. He was working two jobs. He was working long hours on those two jobs. 
and that uh, he was uh, somewhat depressed that he couldn't afford to uh, pay for Christmas presents and that he was probably not going to be able to buy Shannon a Christmas present, which added weight to the theory that perhaps he may have uh, caused self-harm. Andrew had been seeing Shannon for just five weeks, but to all who knew them, they were very much in love. He hadn't had a steady girlfriend. He'd had occasional friends. He'd had lots of friends who were girls, but he hadn't sort of been in love before. Um, and it was quite fun to see because he was happy. 25-year-old Andrew Asprey was last seen leaving his girlfriend's Eltham house just before 11pm on Thursday. Today, John Asprey made an emotional plea for help in finding his son. Well, if anybody knows anything, please, will they come forward? Um, and I guess, um, you know, if for some reason Andy's out there, um, please, will he get in touch? It was terribly difficult, those, those first few days, because you, you were getting more and more concerned about him being dehydrated or, or bleeding to death or having a broken leg and lying in, in pain somewhere. I can remember the, the second day we were all out in Warrandyte State Park in the dark. We were out with torches and, and shouting his name. Um, I mean, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> There's no way you'd find him in the dark, but you couldn't go home and sleep. We ended up hiring a helicopter to fly around the area, and some of Andy's friends went up as spotters to, you know, use binoculars and search, fly over the, the local bush to try and see if they could find anything. But there was no sighting of Andrew. It was summer in Australia, and if he were lying seriously injured in the bush, then his chances of survival quickly diminish. Um, so you gradually begin to think about the worst. 24-year-old Andrew Astbury was missing. His van was found outside his home, yet his wallet and mobile phone remained on the driver's seat. Spots of blood, identified as Andrew's, were found on the roadway outside. With four days gone, his disappearance was now a major crime incident. The family and girlfriend of Andrew Asprey have been desperate for news of the 25-year-old. Today, the homicide squad took over the investigation. We believe that Andrew didn't leave his own accord. At this stage, we're unable to say whether Andrew is dead or alive. Homicide were around very early. The first time you hear the word, it's, uh, it's pretty hard. Mm. So that, um, that sort of confirms your worst fears. We were told by the local CLB that they'd used the SES over the weekend to, uh, to search the area, mainly in the area where they'd found the blood droplets. Once we took over the investigation, we decided that we'd use our search and rescue team to search the entire area for the full length of the roadway outside his home and the grass bank outside the, uh, the house as well. And they discovered a blood-stained knife just off the edge of the roadway. There was quite a pool of blood in that area. And there was also a piece of cardboard with a very partial shoe impression. Both the knife and the cardboard were sent back to the crime scene lab. Detectives hoping that either piece of evidence would lead them to or link them to a crime scene. We had a look at the scene itself. It was obvious that there was too much blood for uh, just a simple accident. We now believe that we were looking at a homicide rather than just a uh, missing person. So it now seemed Andrew was dead. But where was his body? The crime scene may well give detectives a clue. And for that, the forensic team would need to use a standard tool of their trade. And it required total darkness. Luminol's a pest that can find very small amounts of blood that aren't visible to the naked eye. It can be very helpful when you are following a trail that you can't actually see 
it can pick it up in the night and it'll glow where the blood is. Luminol normally just reveals blood splatter or uh, small pools of blood, but this is quite an extensive trail. And that blood trail extended over uh, nearly 300 metres through the bushland and underneath trees and through the scrub. Could have led itself that the person was just seriously injured at that stage, but with the amount of blood where the knife was found, it didn't lend itself that the person had walked off. More likely they'd been carried or dragged away. But was it someone uh, large and strong that could carry a body away, or was it somebody helping to carry the body away? Once we got to the end of the Luminol Trail, we found another uh, pool of blood right beside a uh, driveway. It just became apparent then that a vehicle had been used to then take the body away. I had no doubt in my mind from that moment that Andrew was dead. Warnock Road's a pretty isolated location. So we took the move to put a caravan in the area and you're obviously calling on the public for their help. Two locals had remembered seeing a car parked just up the road from Andrew's house on the night he disappeared. They could recall some of the registration number, but more importantly, the car had very distinctive markings. A young fellow were turned up and said that on the night of Andrew's disappearance, he'd uh, driven home uh, down Opossum Road and uh, when he turned into the roadway, he saw a vehicle parked uh, there, which was unusual at that time of night, uh, especially seeing it was a telecom vehicle. The forensic team found tyre marks on the spot that the witnesses had reported and an impression of the tread was taken. Should detectives track down the car, they'd be able to place it at the scene. We organised with Telecom to obtain all the uh, records of uh, Telecom station wagons in the state of Victoria. We had to determine where each of those vehicles was, so there was a process of elimination conducted in regards to speaking to all the drivers of those vehicles and, and putting them into a particular area that night. After searching the records of more than 3,000 Telecom cars, police came up with one car that couldn't be accounted for the night Andrew Astbury went missing. But was the driver of the car an important witness or potentially the young man's killer? Andrew Astbury's disappearance was now being treated as a homicide. A broken knife and a 300 metre trail of his blood ending at a driveway put it in no doubt. Witnesses had seen a car parked near to Andrew's house on the night he disappeared. And now, police had tracked down its driver, Stephen Pavick. The situation was that um, Stephen um, was the ex-boyfriend of Shannon, who was a current girlfriend of uh, Andrew Asprey. Andrew had become friends with Shannon while working as a courier at her flower shop. It was a platonic relationship at first, but that didn't stop Pavick's intense jealousy. Yeah, yeah, so. Stephen Pavick was very jealous of Shannon having a, f a friend, um, being a male friend, being Andrew. We had information from uh, other people, friends, associates, that um, several times Stephen Pavick had made threats against Andrew Asprey. He would be enraged and um, fight and argue with Shannon in relation to um, Shannon being very friendly with Andrew. <laughs> Two months before Andrew disappeared, Pavick's jealousy boiled over at the local pub. When Stephen saw Asprey there, he started to work himself up into a bit of a frenzy. He then went over and spoke loudly with uh, Asprey and threatened him, and then threw a beer over Andrew. Hey! Which also landed on uh, a female friend of Andrew's at the time. She returned the favour and threw her drink over Pavy, who uh, then got even angrier and, uh, and a fight started to develop until the uh, bouncers intervened. As uh, Pavic was leaving the hotel uh, and being evicted by the bouncer, he threatened to, uh, to kill uh, Andrew. Shannon advised us that there had been other occasions where Pavic had been insanely jealous of Andrew for no good reason, and he'd uh, made threats there to, even on one occasion, to uh, shoot him with a shotgun. Uh, she told him not to be so uh, silly about it, but he just continued on uh, with his insane jealousy that there was something going on between uh, Shannon and uh, Andrew, which there wasn't. 
The night of the pub fight, Shannon ended her relationship with Pavic. A few weeks later, she started dating Andrew, but they kept the relationship quiet, fearing Pavic's reaction. You often see it with a lot of young men. Uh, they become insanely jealous of, uh, of their girlfriends not talking to other boys and that. It's childish and puerile, but obviously Pavic suffered from that, along with a lot of uh, young fellows. Just his uh, demeanour across the board showed that at that stage he really hadn't grown up. Pavic's jealousy was extreme, but was he a murderer? Police needed concrete evidence to link him directly to the crime and they hoped it would be found in Pavick's car. The same car seen by witnesses on the night Andrew disappeared. I noticed that the carpet in the rear of the wagon was a slightly different colour than the carpet in the rest of the car. And that made me think that maybe that had been replaced. We looked for blood traces within the vehicle, but nothing was found. There was a potential that the that Andrew's body had been conveyed in the back of the car and that's why the carpet was a different colour. We then uh, knew that he'd purchased the carpet somewhere, so we started looking to where you could buy second-hand Commodore carpets. At a wreckers not far from Pavick's work, the detectives found what they had suspected, a receipt that proved Pavick had bought the carpet the day after Andrew disappeared. We decided then to place surveillance on uh, Pavic, and that's physical surveillance as well as uh, listening devices and telephone intercepts to determine what he was doing, what he was saying, who he was talking to, and what his movements were from there in case he went back to a crime scene to, uh, to hide further evidence. Someone out there must know something. I mean, he's the second of four children, so there's not going to be a Christmas for us this year. Christmas Day was particularly difficult. Um, we all sat around and opened our presents and there was a pile in the corner that wasn't opened. Um, so that was a pretty hard day. The next day, police received a call. Farmer Graham Cock was mustering sheep when he noticed the weighted down body in the middle of the river. I received a phone call late in the evening that a body had been found at Warrandyte, that uh, it was handcuffed to some sort of piece of machinery. And I was told, look, we don't think it's your body. Something deep inside me told me it was Andrew. I, I just rang my crew straight away and said, get up to Warrandyte, I think it's our body. The body was quite decomposed. It appeared to have been in the water well over the time that Andrew had been missing. So Mick Hughes' suspicions that it was the 24-year-old would be proved one way or the other at the post-mortem. One of the uh, recommended first steps in the forensic pathology investigation of a death like this is to um, x-ray the whole of the body, often from multiple angles. The reason for doing this is that you may gather information that helps with identification, but most importantly can assist with documenting injuries that might be obscured by decomposition. The x-ray examination in this case revealed the presence of a triangular metal object within the left upper chest. The object had sharp edges and looked like it was the tip of a knife. I collected the blade from the body of the deceased, brought it back to the laboratory and did a physical fit on the two pieces of knife blade. And I was quite certain that the two pieces had once been the one piece of knife blade. About 3.30 in the morning, there was a knock on the door. Sorry. Um, and two of the homicide squad were sort of uh, were there and said, uh, you know, shall we put the kettle on? Andrew Asbury was missing, presumed dead. For 10 days, family, police and volunteers had searched for him and then his body appeared floating in a river 20 kilometres from his home. He had been handcuffed to an engine part, and these were now the most vital pieces of evidence the police had to work with. Police machinery had been imported into Australia and basically all used on the Sugarloaf Dam project. 
there was no recent history on it. So the decision for me to go to the media was very easy. The only way we're going to find out is to clear it to the public and say, hey, can you help us with the investigation? Detectives today displayed the heavy turbine casing from a German-made generator used to weigh down the body of murder victim Andrew Asbury. The handcuffs are also unusual. They're considered expensive at around $100 a pair and can only be bought at select outlets. Police today revealed they're hunting at least two people. We'll be pouring uh, as many resources as we have into uh, locating the perpetrator or, or indeed uh, perpetrators of uh, this crime. I don't believe that anyone could lift a body that's handcuffed to that machine. It's uh, just too heavy. Even though uh, Paddy had been spoken to by the Doncaster CIU, he'd never been formally approached and interviewed. And I thought we were at a time where he should be interviewed, given the opportunity to um, admit or deny the allegations. I tend to interview you in relation to the death of Andrew John Asprey. You may communicate with or attempt to communicate with a legal practitioner. Do you understand these rights? Yes, can I do that now then? Yeah, just let me finish this. Okay. Well, the next question was going to be, do you wish to exercise any of these rights before the interview proceeds? Yes, I would. Oh. Pavic the, spoke to his solicitor, and his questions. answer to every question Sorry. was the same. On the 15th of uh, December 1994, can you tell me your movements uh, that day? I've got no comment. Do you know a person by the name of Andrew Asprey? I've got no comment. Do you know a person by the name of Shannon? No comment. Do you drive a Holden Commodore station wagon? No comment. Are you employed at Telecom Australia? No comment. As a result of uh, Pavic providing a no comment interview, we're left with few options. We can either charge him, but we had insufficient evidence at that stage to support the case against him. And so it was decided to, uh, to release him and uh, we just uh, continue on with our investigation. As I was uh, showing uh, Stephen out of the building, He's obviously very antagonistic towards myself and uh, and the others, and he made some comment about uh, we'd never be able to get him. My reaction to that was as well, we'll see what comes about. Stephen Pavick had set the detectives a challenge. Their next move was to link him to the handcuffs used on Andrew's body. So they conducted a systematic search of the stores near his home, and they struck gold. Pavic had bought a pair of handcuffs one month before the murder. Pavic told uh, the owner of the store that uh, he wanted to purchase the handcuffs for a mate's Buxton. The handcuffs were very expensive handcuffs, they were over $100. The owner recalled saying to Pavic, why don't you buy a cheaper pair? He said, no, I want a very good pair because I used to have a pair and they fell apart. Then there was a breakthrough on the engine part. The next day, we received a phone call from a uh, off-duty young policeman. He had a mate who had spoken with him and said that he knew where the motor part came from, that it, he'd sent it on a track up in Coldstream. They thought they'd go up and have a look, and if the piece of machinery wasn't there, they'd know, well, it is the piece of machinery we were talking about. They went up there the next day, couldn't find uh, the motor part there, but found some yellow pieces that would have gone with the motor part, so they contacted uh, us at Homicide. In the search, they found a, uh, a garbage bag uh, secreted in a hollow log with uh, some grass just thrown over the top of it to cover it. The bag contained uh, a number of clothing items, uh, shirts, uh, runners. It also contained uh, three pairs of jeans. One pair of jeans we could positively identify as belonging to the deceased, Andrew Asprey. One pair of jeans, there was a big blue S written in texture on the pocket. When that was shown to Shannon, she was able to uh, identify the clothing as belonging to Stephen Pavick because Pavick's mother always wrote in texture on her two sons' clothing to differentiate the two boys' clothing. But the garbage bag also contained another pair of jeans. Which led us to believe that there were only two possible scenarios that may have taken place. One is uh, two persons committed the crime, or one person committed the crime and another person helped dispose of the body. That was our thinking at the time. It became essential to know who owned the other set of clothing. After finding the jeans, we knew that the person we were looking for was quite short, 
most of uh, Pavic's friends were tall or large, and there was only one person these jeans could have fit who was an associate of Pavic's. Uh, we eventually arrested him and uh, spoke to him at our office. We showed him the pair of jeans and he confirmed that they were his, but denied any involvement in the death of Andrew Asprey and provided us with a plausible explanation as to how his jeans came to be in the bag with uh, the deceased and Pavix. They'd been left in Pavix's car some weeks prior when they'd been down to the beach. Pavic had told his friend that the clothing had been lost and actually physically gave him $50 to replace their clothing. We believe that after Pavic murdered Asprey, he then used this person's jeans to wipe the blood off the back section of the vehicle before he stuffed it in the bag with the rest of the clothes. The finding of the black garbage bag with the clothes inside it, it proved to be the evidence we required to put it beyond any shadow of a doubt that Stephen Pavic was the offender in this case. Also in the bag, gloves and a pair of blood-stained runners, size 11 and a half the same size that Stephen Pavick wore. The left tread was consistent with the footprint on the cardboard found next to the murder weapon. Police now had the hard evidence they needed to arrest Pavick. Right. I'll further put it to you that that's the reason why you went over to Andrew's place that night, because you saw his van in the driveway at your girlfriend's place. What do you say to that? You're just putting words in my mouth. I'm putting an allegation to you and... Uh, no, no, it's not true. Anyway, it's not true. All roads and evidence in regard to Andrew Astbury's murder were leading to one person, Stephen Pavick. Not only had he threatened Andrew two months before, but his bloody shoes, jeans and gloves were found in a garbage bag near to where Andrew's body was found. This morning, homicide detectives arrested a 24-year-old Eltham man at his work in Preston and are questioning him over the killing. Do you know anything in relation to the disappearance and murder of Andrew Asprey? Yes. What can you tell me about it? The night that Andrew disappeared, I just went past Shannon's house and um, saw Andrew's car parked out the front. Just went home. And what have you done once you've got home? I just sat down on my bed for a while and just had a beer. And while you're sitting there uh, having a drink, what's happened then? I was just, just started thinking about Andrew's car being at the front of Shannon's house. Mm -hmm. I wanted Shannon to be um, my girlfriend again. So I just wanted to find out like what was happening, if he was going out with her or anything. Mm -hmm. Just in case he was, I just I wanted to just, like scare him a little bit. I didn't want to hurt him. That's just one thing I didn't want to do. I didn't want to hurt him. I didn't want to cause him any pain or anything like that. I just wanted to scare him a little bit and find out what's happening. So I um, went into the garage and grabbed a fishing knife, got in the car and drove to Warrandyte. I parked down this little road and just jumped up to Andrew's joint. It was... And, um, I was sitting somewhere around here. We can't sort of remember exactly where. Just somewhere around there. Right. I, I went down there and had a piss. Put on some my gym gloves just in case I got into an argument with Andrew or something. And if he punched me, so I could punch him back without hurting my hands. Then Andrew's car just pulled up there. Towards the stones there? I, th I think it was up there, up there. I can't remember exactly where. And so I just walked up there behind it. I was just kneeling down behind it because I didn't want him to see me. I wanted to surprise him. I heard his car door open and pulled, walked up next to him and just said, I want to talk to you. I grabbed him in a headlock yep. and started walking down here. 
and I pulled out my knife, just sort of shoved it in his face, saying what was happening. Walked over to here, and then the next thing I knew, I fell down there, and like we both ended up sort of over there. You just roll around on the grass, sort of wrestling a bit. And the next thing I knew, I just stabbed him. And the handle just broke off. I don't know if it was because it rolled on top of it or something. And um, he just yelled, and I just didn't know what to do. There was blood everywhere. I was just saying sorry, put my hand over his mouth to stop him yelling because he was just yelling and I just said sorry and just ran away. When I went back, it was just, just wasn't making a noise. So I just grabbed him and carried him down the end of the road. How were you carrying him at this stage? I think it was sort of like, if you want me to show you, I think it was just sort of like, like that. In all the reenactments I've done, Yes, offenders will uh, intimate how they've done a particular uh, action and that, not physically involve me in the process. Like that. And to be picked up and, and so easily by a powerful man, that was a little bit daunting in some regards. That path that he took was up and down Dale, it was through the bush and underneath trees and that. It would have taken a lot of physical power and exertion to carry a body that far. Uh, he was a very powerful man. Kept dragging him along until I got up to the top. It took a pretty long time. And then I quickly rang back and got the car. Pavic's car was parked just down from the driveway. The place, witnesses had seen it on that fatal night. And then I just went up there and grabbed him and just dragged him and ch chucked him in the back of the car. Pavic then drove Andrew's body to bushland, 20 kilometres away. I took his clothes off because they were all covered in blood. And I had a, a garbage bag in the car just with some clothes from a friend of mine. Who's down, we went down to the beach on the weekend and I had his clothes in and a few towels and stuff. So I just chucked them in there. Just put it in that log, that burnt log down there. Just in there. Yep. And then when I was walking up, I saw the um, that big yellow thing. Pavic handcuffed Andrew to the engine part and then dumped him in the river. <laughs> Pavic cried at one stage of the interview. I think it's more a case of he was crying because of the pressure on him and that he'd been caught. I don't think there was much remorse about uh, that he killed Andrew, just a case of that he'd been caught. I just want everyone to know that I just didn't plan this to happen. It just happened like that. It was just it's something unfortunate. I did, this was the last thing in the world that I wanted to happen. So Stephen Pavick had admitted to killing Andrew Astbury, yet he was trying to establish a case for manslaughter. However, detectives had evidence it was a premeditated, brutal murder. We knew a lot of what he was telling us was, was uh, rubbish. Um, so from our point of view, it was, he was putting on a good show. Homicide Squad detectives led Stephen Francis Pavick into the city watch house late last night after a day of questioning. 24-year-old Stephen Pavick had been charged with the murder of Andrew Astbury. He had told police that he was there the night Andrew died, but Andrew's death was an accident. I just want everyone to know that I just didn't plan this to happen. It just happened like that. It was just it's something unfortunate. I did, this was the last thing in the Throughout world. Throughout his interview and walk around with the police, he reiterated this a number of times. Like, I didn't mean to hurt him down there. Look, I didn't want any of this to happen, and it's just sort of mm -hmm. happened. I just want to say that, like, I didn't want this to happen, and yep. I feel terrible about it all. We knew exactly what had taken place, and we knew that he was setting up a manslaughter defence. We knew a lot of what he was telling us was, was uh, rubbish. And it's totally self-serving. 
it's to try and convince a judge and jury that um, it was a spontaneous action that resulted in Andrew's death, and it wasn't. It was a premeditated murder. So, from our point of view, it was he was putting on a good show. Why did you take the knife with you from uh, home to Andrew's house? To try and scare Andrew. I put it that to you that you intended to take the knife with you to kill Andrew, what do you say? No, no way, no way. There's no way I would have done that. He rolled on top of me and I rolled on top of him and the, the handle was just busted off and... Do you know where the handle was? No, it was somewhere down there, I'd say. I, I don't know exactly I think exactly where Pavic, like a lot of good lawyers, put in 90% truth and 10% fiction. The bits about uh, it being an accident, I think, was fiction. I thought it was nonsense. Um, I was at the post-mortem and uh, I saw the blade being removed from Andrew's body and nothing would convince me that uh, he was stabbed accidentally in a struggle. And it was proved fact by the forensic pathologist. A considerable degree of force would need to be applied to the knife to cause the tip to snap off. It appeared that the knife was inserted above the left collarbone um, and headed almost vertically downwards through the subclavian artery, causing damage to the collarbone and the first rib and entering the upper part of the left chest. Because of the number of injuries to bone seen in this case, the knife was either inserted multiple times through the same injury or that with a single insertion, the knife was moved around um, while it was inserted in the body. These features are not consistent with accidental injury and are most consistent with um, intentional injury. Pavic was just far superior in size and strength. And uh, if Pavic had grabbed him, he wouldn't have had a chance of escaping or fighting back for that matter. And there was further damning evidence. Police had in their hands proof that this was not the accident that Pavic claimed. We became aware of a uh, conversation with Pavic where uh, Pavic indicated that his intention was to kill Andrew and that uh, he believed that he'd uh, probably get away with a manslaughter. I've spoken to a solicitor, right? Yeah, when it comes to the crunch, I'm going to spew my guts and tell him what happened. And I stabbed the... Probably get away with manslaughter. I just have to make sure that, like, no one knew it was premeditated. In that same conversation, we had uh, pretty damning admissions that he'd had premeditation, that he'd laid in wait for Andrew on at least one other occasion and Andrew hadn't come home. If we don't find evidence in these cases to prove premeditation or an intent to kill, and the story goes before a jury, where you have um, the lovesick fellow who lost his girlfriend and goes to sort it out with a new boyfriend, then most occasions they will get off with a manslaughter. So for us, it was very important that we had those admissions of premeditation. It was clear by now that Stephen Pavick had murdered Andrew Astbury in cold blood. If there was any doubt as to how callous he'd been, his refusal to say how he dumped the body was a clear sign of his guilt. Just down there, just down there and across through there, and then down and then just down to the river. All right, do you want to come down with us? And... I, I, look, I, I don't know, this is sort of dragging on a bit. You sort of know everything now, don't you? Well, we just want to see which way you've come down here, Steve. No, I'm not, I don't want to say anything else, sorry. Sorry? No, I'm not saying anything else about this. Look, there's a massive hill there, it's just... Sorry. When we stopped the tape and asked him why he didn't want to continue at that stage, he said that uh, he'd thrown the body over a cliff and, uh, and, and the jury would, uh, would convict him without a worry in the world if they knew of those things, so he didn't want to continue at that stage. The way he treated the body was disrespectful. I mean, you know, he stripped the body down, he threw away jewellery and items of identification. He's uh, dragged the body through the bush, he's thrown it over cliffs, uh, he's weighted it down and thrown it into the river. He had no concern about what he was doing to Andrew's body. He just wanted to do what he had to do to get rid of the body. Andrew Asprey's family and friends walked from the Supreme Court relieved at the guilty verdict, but still reeling from his brutal slaying. At Andrew's funeral, the uh, celebrant said, let uh, justice prevail. And, uh, it's good to see it does. 
there was a big sense of relief when they reached a guilty verdict. Um, it really helped to um, have confirmed what we felt, that there was no way that this wasn't planned. Well, the murder conviction was important to me, and I've got to be honest, it gave us a great deal of satisfaction from the point of view of... We're a bit of a silent witness, I guess, for Andrew, too, is... Uh, Andrew's the only other person that knows the true version of events and he can't speak out, he's dead. So our role is really his representative. So from my point of view, for the Asprey family, for Shannon, uh, for Andrew himself, it was very, very important. And it was very satisfying to take it from a manslaughter to a murder. Jilted lover Stephen Francis Pavich has been sentenced to a minimum 13 years jail for murdering a man who'd begun dating his ex-girlfriend. I can never forgive Pavic. I would lock the door and throw the key away. Um, I don't think he should be allowed back into society. I mean, he'll be... If he gets out for good behaviour, he'll be 38 when he's released. That will be in 2008. My opinion of Pavic? Pavic's a uh, coward and a bully. He's a cowardly assassin who lay in wait for a smaller, weaker man. Uh, they're not the actions of a true man.